Hey everyone, quick note before we start. Johnny and I initially at the top of this podcast announced that we'll be discussing both episodes that aired on Sunday night of Star Trek Discovery. That would include the Vulcan Hello and Battle at the Binary Stars. However, midway through recording, something came up. We had to cut it short, so we are only discussing the Vulcan Hello, despite what you're going to hear in about 10 seconds on the intro. We will have Battle at the Binary Stars for you on Thursday morning, and we will be discussing the Vulcan Hello today only. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another special episode of God Thrones. I'm Alexandra August. I'm Johnny Kolosinski. And we are here to talk to you about Star Trek Discovery. Woo! Finally happened. Uh, 19 the... minutes later than it was predicted to. <laughs> this is the second episode in what will become our Star Trek Discovery podcast. We don't have a name yet, but... I've been fighting really hard for the Philippa Georgiou Memorial Hour. <laughs> It just makes me too sad. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's I think it's a bit of a downer. Spoilers. I just can't fit it on Twitter. <laughs> um, so you'll find the first couple of episodes in the Got Thrones stream once we settle on a title and have a couple of episodes in the bag, which should be by next week. We'll scooch it over to iTunes under its own title and its own thing. Um, but you're fine right here for now. If you're subscribed to Got Thrones, you'll get all the information about where this Discovery podcast will live in the near future. So relax and enjoy the ride. Yeah. So let's, um, this is pretty momentous. This yeah. Is, we have a brand new Star Trek series on television for the first time in 15 years. It's pretty incredible. Um, and it, the production value of the show is better, in my opinion, than the production value of any of the films barring first con- well I'm sorry any of the prime universe films barring first contact oh yeah i completely completely agree with you just wh- how did you feel after watching this episode like just kind of emotional check in we're going to do some some overall thoughts and then get into a recap yeah we're going episodes. to broadly go before we dive deep <laughs> um overall i thought it was the if not the best pilot in the history of all the series, the best after emissary. Um, it even as a, it, it just as a pure episode of television, I thought it was the strongest starting point that we've had so far on a series. Uh, that being said, I understand the idea to build out both that we are discussing both episodes uh, to build them out as a prologue, but not seeing discovery at all, I think is going going to leave some audience members uh, blue balled. I guess, for lack of a better term. Yeah, I actually, um, after your ringing endorsement of After Trek last night, I tuned in for about 15 minutes of it. And that was something Matt Myra, who's the host of that, kept shouting over and over again. It's just like, we didn't say Discovery! Where's ha ha? Are you hiding at some... Um, it's not a great Matt Myra impression. Um, <laughs> yeah, I it, it definitely was a bit... I think they've been they've been so enigmatic about this, the, the plot of this series... And there been, there's been so much mystery surrounding it. And I think the twist of this being a prologue and, ooh, we kind of bait and switched you with Michelle Yeoh in this dual ship. And why are, why are we casting two ships when the show is supposed to be about discovery? And, you know, s- speculation mm-hmm. ruled the internet over that. And it just, to me, I, I like the ambition of it. I really loved the ambition in every aspect of this pilot but it was just i had to watch it again to be like okay all right now i'm comfortable with this this makes sense to me and i'm really really excited to see the follow-up i'm excited to see episode Mm -hmm. three i'm excited to see the rest of the series because i think in the context of the rest of the season this pilot is going to make a lot more sense yes but which brings me to the surprising emotion i felt after watching this show and the day like sitting with it on monday and kind of watching it again um i was excited to be excited about star star trek again i was excited to sort of go back to that emotion that that emotional place that i was in when i was watching the show first run 
Um, and I was very, very surprised at the end of it when what I felt wasn't this just glee and happiness. It was this sort of, it was homesickness. I was sad. Mm -hmm. And I think I don't, it, it was, but it felt like I had sort of run into this new experience that I knew was going to be intense, expecting it to be just all be intensely positive. And it wasn't. <laughs> and it was, but it's still, but I'm still excited by it. So it was kind of, kind of like the feeling I got as like watching my mother drive away when I was at college and knowing that like, I was never going to live at home again. And this was like, this was a totally new chapter in my life. And it was scary and kind of weird, but also interesting. I don't know. That's, um, yeah, it was Star Trek, but it was so, so different. Mm -hmm. And not in a way that I think is precludes me not in a way that would make me say like oh i really just don't want i'm not in a way that would make me sort of mentally wish this wasn't part of the canon um i'm really very intrigued by it but um it was unsettling yeah i'm my concern is that because it is a serialized show that we will lack the episodes that have the moments of levity and um. And and those aspects of relationships between characters, you know, will lack will lack the especially especially with like having seen the teaser for episode three, that we won't get the sense of camaraderie and overcoming adversity through the power of our group. That it'll lean too much on adverse. Uh, antagonism between the crew okay all right yeah i'm that is a that's something that i would like to touch on once we get to the introduction of lieutenant saru mm -hmm. because you speak to you speak to a, you, sp you speak to something that i've really been thinking about and i think we could delve into it um but before we get into specifically about crew relationships and the way this starfleet crew operates versus the other starfleet crews that we've seen operate um but before that i kind of want to talk a little bit about the cinematography of this episode and just what it looked like because I found that informing my experience of this show more than any other Star Trek I've ever watched. Yes. And um, it wasn't necessarily positive. It When it was positive, it was exceptional. When was that? I think from a pure design standpoint, the look of the show is excellent uh i i dig it's the new uniforms eerie. what it's almost eerie okay yeah i i think i i would have liked a little bit more light on the bridge but i like it better than the abrams enterprise which i, I do like. too um, yeah the, the abrams enterprise is a little bit too yeah it just it reminds me of a cafeteria it's too it's too white yeah the Bridge of the Shenzhou, I liked. I liked the new design choices with, okay, we're going to make this modern technology. Um, we're going to be the future of now, not the future uh, of the 1960s. But I felt that the cinematography kept me from getting a feel for the shape of the bridge and and who lives where and does what. It really, yeah, I mean, you couldn't get a clear look at anything. That's kind of why, like, my biggest takeaway from this episode is just a general sense of discomfort and confusion because they hammer, there's so much going on. Mm -hmm. There's so, so, so much going on. And you can see, you can really feel the too many cooks in the kitchen. Everyone wanted to, to be involved in, to have their voice heard. In yeah, they wanted to the leave their new... signature. Yes. So, so we have we have actors who are doing amazingly who are doing some amazing intense work, but unfortunately the actors are really overplaying it because the dialogue is doing all the work for them. Mm -hmm. So there's way too much there's too much dialogue. Things are way too overexplained. And then on top of that, you have these really really committed intense performances by the actors, which are now just theatrical at this point. And then beyond that, to lend you to the sense of fear and unease and fear of the unknown, we have this camera that looks like it's a funhouse mirror. 
changing the angle. Like when she's talking to Sarek in when she talks to Sarek in the um in the ready or in her quarters, I guess, when she has the holographic conversation, it's the camera focuses straight on Sarek and then it's at an angle when it's yeah. on Michael Burnham. It's and at a Dutch angle. Yeah, and it just doesn't there was such a dreamlike well, when, when, like halfway through it I was like oh okay this is a prequel maybe it's a flashback mm-hmm. because it's really brightly lit even without the beacon shining kind of at the end of the Vulcan, the Vulcan hello it's very shiny and shimmery and it looks like, very dreamlike and then at the end of the episode or the end of the binary stars um, between, two, between two binary stars um, it's not a flashback and it's just yeah. reality and it was just kind of it was just too much yeah and and i mean you had the same type of camera work just in conversations between uh gorgiou and burnham and it was except on the planet except on the planet and the planet the opening teaser or or the the cold open Mm -hmm. fuck yes yeah. All right. Well, okay. Do you think we can, I think we can probably. Um, I do want to do, just, there's one more design element that I want to talk about and okay. get your thoughts on. And that's the uniforms. Um, I surprisingly liked it's, I like them and I don't like, I think the boots are kind of dumb and I think <laughs> it's a little weird that they're all in onesies, but I think they're two pieces. I think it's a jacket and it just looks jumpsuity. I think so. I saw there's a shot of Michelle Yeoh that I was like, Huh. I, maybe it might be one of the. It might be like the. It might be like the Voyager DS9 uniforms where it was a mm-hmm. jumpsuit and then you put like the turtleneck and the jacket over it, or like yeah. the jacket was one piece. <laughs> really complicated uniforms on Star Trek. I remember when the Voyager when I realized that there was like, like a pants jumpsuit underneath the turtleneck and underneath the jacket of Voyager, and I was just like, that's hot. That's got to yeah. be really warm. That is three layers, Starfleet. And one of them is velour. Yeah, and they had like stirrup pants on the ankle. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, my my thoughts, uh, my thought, I like the look of the uniforms I a like the, lot. The color, especially the color, especially. Uh, I like that people can repurpose their Fallout cosplay into uh, Discovery cosplay. And mm-hmm. uh, the one thing that I don't like is that it is very hard to distinguish rank and yeah, role and department compared to uh, compared to earlier series because the silver yeah the sil- silver gold bronze breakdown doesn't always d- fit based on lighting etc and it, you exactly. can't get a quick look and the only rank designation i saw was captain and admiral unless the piping on the shoulder like the shoulder i'm i'm motioning yeah, on I myself know what you mean. Unless that piping, like the number of pipes, relates to the number of pips, yeah, I, it, I, I don't see it. Um, I, I mean, I guess you could make the case like, okay, this was the last uniform they did where they couldn't fucking tell what anybody did. So then they switched to the color, <laughs> and then they switched to color. So then they switched to space pajamas. Yeah, um, I did. Le- um, yeah, that was another another element. I think that was just had I watched it again, I would have been like, and I was confused by the uniforms. Yeah. Um. But one thing I really did like that I found was incredibly touching was that the insignias are not communicators, but they're their dog tags. Yeah. That was dope. Yes. That's the kind of stuff that I wanted from this show, to bring Star Trek to that level of nuance. Mm-hmm. Um, and to to repurpose and this is a Brian Fuller thing. I mean, if you've if you if you're a Hannibal fan, like that's why initially I was so excited to get that we got Brian Fuller, because Hannibal basically took elements from the silence of the lambs franchise all of thomas harris's books and the movies that they had made up until that point and kind of beautifully interwove them and like threw them in a bag and shook them up and gave them to us in kind of a new and different form but he still called back to things really brilliantly within that setup and i know that star trek can't play with their canon the way hannibal played with it with it but it still has the capacity to take elements from previous series and change them a little bit but in ways that really heighten the drama and build the world make the world even more um that really add to the world like this was a new development this was a change that feels like something we that's something that was already true about star trek but that we didn't know yet and that's i think like what this prequel where this prequel needs to live if it's going to be successful and be embraced by the trek community Mm -hmm. and the audience i think so yeah and I think just from, like I said, watching Star Trek, well, like you said, watching After Trek, 
uh, and reading interviews with the folks involved with, with, with the production team, I think, I think that the love of Star Trek is there. 100%. Yeah. That, and so I don't have any fears, any fears that they're going to try to make changes to make Star Trek better, quote, better. I, I think that, that I think that there will be changes and adaptations to canon because you can't do a a new series fifteen years later and be one hundred percent on the nose and still have a good story. The canon was written by people who were writing in different eras and in different times when storytelling was a little bit different, especially and on TV. So it totally makes sense. Originally, but I think... they were writing it before the idea of canon existed. Yeah, yeah. So there's already mistakes within Star Trek canon. Like, they realized somewhere during the next generation or probably, like, I, somewhere, it... somewhere in the movies where they were like, oh, we should probably be writing this down. People in, are going to check up on it. In the first few episodes of the original series, it's Earth Starfleet. The idea of the the Federation doesn't show up immediately. Oh, I didn't uh, realize that. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Is with, that can we? Yeah. With that, we can I think move into the episode itself. Yeah. Um. Pretty audacious opening. Yeah, I loved it. Absolutely. Klingons. Um. These well, are the Klingoniest Klingons. Well, it, it, ever Klingon. The Klingons weren't in the cold open, were they? Yeah, they were. It was the it was the initial. Um... No. Oh, yep, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. it was I'm their sorry. initial. I forgot immediately that that, that was the very first thing we saw. Because <laughs> I loved the planet. I will. And the subtitles were distracting. Like the the font was really distracting. <laughs> yeah, like, it was guys, a little like... too. I'm trying to look at me giving weight to this. I know. Even the subtitle guy really needed to put a signature on it. He's like, oh, yeah. guys, can we do this like cool Star Trek font that I designed? Right. As opposed to yeah. as opposed to Game of Thrones where it's yellow. Exactly. Because it's a different language. Yeah. It's yeah. It just it really it, it made me immediately. I stopped taking it seriously. I, I also oh. had the issue where I watch all of I watch TV with subtitles on, especially stuff that I'm going to be discussing on a podcast. And so over the first few subtitles in every Klingon scene, I see speaking Klingon in a subtitle <laughs> over the words that they're saying. Oh, so it's just a mess that's, and doubly that's distracting. That's the TV design thing. Great. <laughs> Great. So this is where Takuvma announces his sort of initial plan, at least mm-hmm. such as it is. And he demonizes the Federation and its cohorts or anybody who thinks like them, as these sort of shady conquerors, that they come under the banner of peace, but really what they're trying to do is kind of conquer through assimilation, really. Because he's worried that with the coming of the Federation comes Federation culture and a dilution of Klingon culture. So it's it's very xenophobic fear. And he is going to, he thinks the only way to defeat the Federation and ensure that does not happen is to unite the 24 warring houses um, on Klonos mm-hmm. that make up the Klingon Empire, and mm-hmm. we discuss we discuss this yeah in our pregame show that the Klingons and the Federation um, have been basically at a cold war for a century since they made first contact, and as we also mentioned, it did not go well. Right. Um. So this is this reminded me a little bit of the cold open to the Battlestar Galactica miniseries. It was so ominous and mm-hmm. very much we mean business. Yeah. Um, and I like the design. I'm sorry. I keep harking into the design of things Mm -hmm. because that's where my eye goes. I like the design of the new Klingons. It works for me. I like the, a little bit more Egyptian inspired and a little less, um, uh, Mad Max inspired regalia. There, when we get to the funeral, man, that's where I'll join you there. Mm-hmm. But I agree with you. I think that they, um, the Klingons were simultaneously my favorite and least favorite thing about this episode because, or the two episodes, I think they absolutely nailed Klingon culture. I was, I enjoyed all of that. Like it's, it didn't feel, it, it felt very organic. It felt, it felt like I said, it, it sort of, it, it touched on that place where it, it felt like it fit in the Star Trek universe. Mm-hmm. Felt very at home. That said, they, boy, do they like to pontificate and talk slowly. And yeah. boy, was there a lot of that. 
I I hope that when that once we're past to Kuvma, we're going to get a little bit more conversational and less declarational Klingon, yeah. because that's one of the, the reasons that I think again, hearkening back to Game of Thrones, uh, that Game of Thrones did Dothraki so well is that it was a language that was being used colloquially too. Yeah, lose co- used colloquially and used as, in conversation. And yeah. if we if, got to see like the Dothraki take coffee breaks basically. Uh, yeah. Whereas we get we got to see Takuvma speak things that he knows is going to be written down in scrolls that are referenced in Voyager a hundred fifty years later. Okay, so we've established that Takuvma is seeking to reunite the Klingon Empire because apparently it's in shambles and due to all this mm-hmm. infighting, which is, Johnny and I made the point last week, why there's been a cold war and not just an all-out war. It's because right. the Klingons are busy right now. Um, yeah. But that period is ending and Takuvma ends with this amazing line and he's um, saying um, they, um, under their, they'll come under the veil of their lie. We come in peace. Right. And... Uh, and we were, yeah. which, which harkens to Deep Space Nine and the insidiousness of the Federation. Yeah, it's a point that's been made. It's interesting as like American politics has evolved over the last 50 years. So is the role of the Federation from being a sort of benevolent savior to being sort of an insidious, um, wishy, an insidious um, bully. Mm hmm. Because it's I what I liked about this particular scene and most of Takuvma's stuff, despite the fact that he does pontificate quite a bit, is that he's kind of morally ambiguous. I don't think that he's a villain. It doesn't. He's. I don't think he's evil. I suppose he's not. He's a villain. He's not evil. Even but even like there's, he's a villain in his actions. I think in his in well, Rose paved to hell and all that. But anyway. I, don't, I, I think that there's a. I think that there. He's far from two dimensional. Yes, is all I can he's, say he's not him. a two dimensional villain. No, by any means. No, but but his his good intention is to destroy the Federation exactly. and, and crush them under his boot. Yeah, yeah. So because Klingons don't really Klingons just don't Klingons just they don't have any chill. Mm-hmm. They just can't do anything halfway, which is why they're either at war with you or they're a mess it's one of the two there's no in between with the klingons so moving on from the klingons i think we both agree that design we're really really happy with the design i i I don't love the i think the makeup is a little makeup prosthetic work is a little too big of a change for me to say i love it right away but does it okay? So nobody, I feel like nobody's called this out. They look like the Klingons from the Prime universe, from the Kelvin universe, and that I can kind of that kind of design change. Even though the Kelvin universe did the work of saying, "Hey, we're a whole different universe," so they can play a little bit more. How much did I, we? How many Klingons did we see in the Kelvin universe? We see them in um Into Darkness. Okay. And they're wearing oh, yeah. um, they're yeah. wearing helmets that make them look. They're wearing like ridged helmets that make them look bald, and I think they are actually bald. It's you know, so it's not. I, again, I get the the nitpickiness of being like, well, they're in their own universe, so they can break the rules more. But to me, this felt like, okay, we can redesign the Klingons a little bit. We'll make them look like the the Kelvin universe, so there is some frame of reference for it. But we're we're gonna fudge this, though. They've also a lot of the producers have also said like, listen, if something doesn't look canon, just give us a minute and we'll get around to it. Like Alex Harbarg has said that, or um, that's not his name. Harbert has said that um several times so we may as yet get an explanation for why they look different but it yeah doesn't suit but what bothered me was just that like they're it really impact it obstructs their speech and it's hard for me to kind of it really obstructs the actors just use of their face as a tool to express emotion mm-hmm. <laughs> this is everything's very stiff yeah um watching Going back and watching some of the old, like, non-war Klingons, I think still had the same, had a similar issue. Yeah, because they had that rubbery armor. Yeah, well, they had that rubbery armor, and they had the, like, Worf's uh, makeup got dialed back a bit. 
Oh yeah, that's to right. Other Klingons. Yeah. Um, so it it, it just um, I miss you on that for different reasons. Um, but it didn't. It wasn't something that took me out of it. I guess I'm curious to see like I'm like, I am really curious to see what we get with, from the Klingons when they're not all in a throne room talking about how they're going to take over the world. Right. Um. So and then with that we head directly down to the planet, right? Yep. Um. Where uh we don't see the uniforms right away because uh Captain Georgiou and uh, Mike are exploring are saving a species that should be that are under the protection of the prime directive. And yeah, they just even get away with it. That's their plan. Yeah. Another thing, what Johnny and I have talked about just, just being kind of a, this whole episode, taking a cup, taking a rewatch to really understand. I was like, it took me a minute to under, like, okay, so you're on the planet for the well and okay. <laughs> yeah. And I was and... like, you seem to be disobeying the prime directive. Are we just kind of playing fast and loose with that? Right they, they, they're, they're playing by Kirk rules. They're playing by what? Kirk rules. Or Janeway rules. Or Janeway rules. She's yeah, it's a thing. So so that happens. Um, they they get the well working again after firing their guns in it. It's a pretty cool effect. All the while they're talking about how Burnham has worked under Captain George Yu on the Shenzo for seven years as her number one. I, it seemed like she was her first officer the entire yep. time. I so, don't think... Yeah... But it, so yeah, she's worked. Yeah, she's worked for seven years, and it's time for her own command. And Burnham is kind of ecstatic and also very humble and gra- and grateful. Uh, then they realize a storm is coming in faster than they expect, but they're out of trans. Uh, the storm is also interfering with transporters. Blah blah blah. The Enterprise can't see them to pick them up. So Captain Giorgio says something enigmatic, and they go for a walk. And then it's the whole like, oh, when you're lost, you're found. Because it turns out while they've been walking, and it doesn't seem like she knew where she was going, she was making the shape of a star. She was making insignia. Snow Angel. She was, yeah, she was, yeah, she was snow angeling a Star Trek. She was sand angeling a Star Trek insignia with this pattern of her steps so the ship could see them. Which, which I loved. See, I liked it. I thought it was neat, but I was like, it is windy in that desert. I don't think the ship still doesn't know quite where to look for you. It just seemed a little gimmicky. And like, even when I saw it in the trailer, I was like, is that? It just reminded me of how people are saying that when on Game of Thrones, that when the dead disperse from that battle sequence in um beyond the wall that they that make they... the wolf insignia yeah and i was just like no they don't they sh- uh. and this seems like the like whoever watched that on this like it seems like oh somebody who idea. did believe yeah so, yeah it seemed like somebody who like somebody whoever did whoever's idea that was was like oh i saw this thing on game of thrones or like yeah would have thought that that was an amazing Reshoot. idea yeah so why so what excited was it just fun for you? like what was your yeah no, you I, thought, agree I, like, I thought it was just really it it was a neat I, I thought it was neat fan service yeah and I it mean, was kind of a neat bait and i like it, the idea behind this sort of oh you think she's doing one thing and it doesn't look like it and it's sort yeah. of exam- it really um it really exemplified that eternal star trek conflict human emotion over vulcan logic and how sometimes logic fails um or sometimes yeah. it doesn't look like sometimes like things are not always what they seem uh da, da, da. the one thing so on the i just want to talk briefly on the seven years aspect i do think that it's really cool that we opened on burnham and georgiou Mm-hmm. In with a relationship that is as old as the relationship between Picard and Riker, or uh, Cisco and, N- and Kira, or Janeway. Yeah, that, and, yeah I got it. Yeah, it's yeah. it's. So yeah, I hadn't seven thought of that. Nice touch. Yeah. Well, no, I just I hadn't thought. Well, I, on that like twenty minutes of after track that I watched. Um, Ellen Harberts, Aaron Harberts talks about, Jesus Christ, I hope he never listens. Um, he <laughs> I talks hope he does about so that we can how, apologize to him in person someday. Right. <laughs> I hope he does. Or but like, um, He mentioned the fact that they really, really, really wanted to nail down. They wanted to use this prologue to nail down Burnham's character, specifically her relationship with Giorgio. Yes. That that was incredibly, incredibly important. And it kind of just makes me wish that. I could have streamed this all at once because 
I think that we're going to get all the payoff from the weirdness of this whole prequel finale or prequel premiere pilot in the next like two episodes. Then it's going it, to then it's going to fit really nicely like a puzzle piece. But right now yeah. it's just sort of like, wow, wow. But I agree. And I think it was it wound up being very, very effective. But mm-hmm. I love the fact that like, because I mean, we saw your I love that you brought that up because now I'm thinking about how much of a relationship we actually got to see between Riker and Picard. And it really is bringing home how close these two would have been. Like, what if Riker had made this decision? Yeah. But, okay, we should, um, let's get to that. Um, Now I'm excited to look at her eventual mutiny under new, under new lens. So Mm -hmm. after the desert, obviously they're being back up and we get our first look at the Shenzo's bridge and some of the interior design of the ship and uh, Lieutenant Saru, who is yeah. Doug Jones, he finally, who I love. Yeah, he find like he we um finally get to see him in action, and he's the one who tells us that a communications relay is damaged. That's mm-hmm. what they're going to check out, and it's through basically through deduction that. That Michael it was realizes sabotage. That yeah, that it was sabotage in an effort to draw them out here, but as of yet, they don't know why. So she decides, so Burnham decides that she's going to go investigate and she puts on a dope yeah. suit with glitter space pants yeah. and takes a walk. Doesn't yeah, she... fly by. But important to note, there's a lot of radiation around because it's the binary star, it's a binary star system. So she's only allowed to go out for 20 minutes. And so she's supposed to just do a flyby. And that's where she encounters the Klingon. And her first contact with them goes about as well as, or it's her second the... contact with Klingons goes first, about as well as yeah, her first. Yeah, I guess it is her second contact too. That was, this was one of the first, when he landed on his batleth, or when she pushed his batleth into him, that was one of the first moments where, that was the first moment where I was like, oh, fuck, this is, I have to fasten my seatbelt. This is, Mm -hmm. this is Star Trek with the gloves off. Yeah. That, like, that would have been a, a once in a season sort of thing. Yeah. Especially with with um, how much weight is in the death of that particular Klingon. Like, they haven't had any contact with the Klingons mm-hmm. in a hundred years. They're not. They're clearly up to something nefarious. And she kills one of them. And they have no intelligence about the region. They have, or they have, and they don't have any intelligence about what's going on. So they could have potentially really stepped in a hornet's nest, which is exactly what's happened. And right. so, yeah, like. Just her killing the Klingon that way is out of place and intense for Star Trek, but the ramifications of that death, just because we've always had the damn Star Trek reset button, and so we've never had something like this. No one's ever fucked up this badly before. Right. Or if they have, it's been, uh, I always want to, I always get the title of it, In the Pale Moonlight. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they not, a... not fucked up, but. Fucked up. Yeah. yeah. So... All of our How decisions did... are going to have that kind of weight, I guess is what, what I'm saying. Yeah, I, you know, I, I th- yeah, I, that makes sense. How did you, what did you think of, this was clearly some eye candy, mm-hmm. just this whole sequence. I think they really wanted us to get, I think they've really wanted to show some serious, they really, I think this was them sort of flexing their muscles effects wise, because it was a gorgeous, gorgeous, watching her sail through the ruin watching her discover a ruin in space was so neat because even like they hit on the archaeology thing with picard quite a bit yeah but it's still neat to me to like do space archaeology it's just yeah. this cool and, and, and they touched on that her background was uh essentially xeno sociology oh, what a dork that's right. so she well and she so i, I love she'd have a podcast <laughs> um there is a strong, the dorkiness is strong in Michael Burnham. That's one of the things that endeared oh, me yeah. to her. I was like, you're a nerd and I like it. Yep. Um, but w- yeah, watching her sort of float around the ruin was beautiful in and of itself. And then hearing the awe in her voice at looking at something this ancient, really, I really connected to that. And that was, that was a lovely moment. Y- yes. I-, I think it was a, it-, it-, it took me back to contact and they should have sent a poet in a good <laughs> way. Yeah. Yeah. It would well. It also, I think, we don't see. I think Star Trek definitely by the time of by the time by the of, end Voyager, of Voyager was, give, was paying exploration lip service. Yeah, they stopped getting impressed. Yeah, they stopped 
and that was sort of that was you know again one of the disappointments about Voyager was that they should have been the ones with their jaws hanging open all the time because they were in like they were in the wild west delta quadrant but right but a story and there was coffee in that nebula and lots of borg and lots of borg so after after the, after the unpleasantness burnham essentially dead floats her way back but she's severely burnt she's got severe radiation burns and it's not looking yeah. good because she stayed out way too long and this is another this was another um this was another scene showcasing their Philippa and Michael's relationship because Philippa looks devastated at the idea of Michael. Right. Uh, Philippa Tom. is not um, uh, Captain. Uh, now I'm blanking on his name. Jennison. Jellico. Jellico. Captain Jellico. No, she is uh, not. She would kick Jellico's ass. Now I really want to see that. Oh, she would. But uh, she she's not. She's not by the books. Or, or, well, it's not that she's not by the books. She's not detached. No, no. From she's, her crew. She's, she, I liken her a lot to Picard because Picard was emotional but semi-detached from his crew. Mm-hmm. Um, but he had grace and intelligence and you really got that he was sort of this learned commander. And that's the elegance that she carries herself with and the elegance of her speech. and But also this sort of, this, you know, really... This raw emotion lying just beneath the sur- beneath the surface played beautifully to me. Mm-hmm. I, I was another reason I was so sad to see her go. Um, but they do they grab they get Burnham back, and then we I think I think the order of this is that um, we cut to a Klingon funeral. Which um, was yeah, we 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 moved to the Klingon funeral, which was super both, dope. It was super dope, but at the same time. It's not in line with what we know about the Klingons, because well, so. in Klingon in Klingon mythology, as it is in the Next Generation era, the body is unimportant, mm-hmm. and it is just meat. Okay, and it's the deeds and the honor that matter, and this is very. Uh-huh body is important the body is important and it might just be th- this might just be takuvma sect that's kind of what yeah because he does that really beautiful well i don't know it's just another example of the show being incredibly over the top this week um when he goes out to collect the dead and he's like i'll prepare their bodies myself and i'm like mm-hmm. oh, no you won't there are like 400 of them and you don't have that like stop it just stop saying shit like that no um, but I, it, I like i get i could well no that's what like i'm a, um but i i hearing what you say like i could believe just because he's already been introduced as an extremist that this is just Mm -hmm. his deal or it's been 150 years and there were some cultural changes i don't know you know now chris obi played to kuvma in uh star trek discovery Discovery, (laughs) and he played uh was he uh i forget it was anubis and american gods and american gods does he just write into his contract hey i also have to be obsessed with death (laughs) And very morose and slow speak and slow yeah. of speech. Yep. If I, I like him. He's, he's hear him he's speak. A, I I think. Oh, he's he's just a slow reader. He's my low key MVP on both these shows already. I think he's he's good. So I'm, this mine is going to be Vogue, and we will get to Vogue, the albino Klingon. S- yeah, soon. Um, in a minute. Uh, was there one thing else that? Yeah, no, I think that's. And then, then we cut to Michael Burnham having a flashback of her time at the Vulcan Science Center, and she is the cutest little Vulcan. Oh yeah, not the best child actor, but my bar is not that high for the yeah. show with child actors. Yeah, better than most Star Trek child actors we've seen. She um, she's in this sort of weird testing pod where uh, it's very Minority Report, but for kids, and she is getting asked a fire. We saw these questions. in uh, Star Trek 2009. Oh, that's okay. They did we look. We saw familiar. this exact design. Okay, good. So, um, basically, she's answering she's answering a series of rapid fire questions about Klingon culture, and she's totally on a roll until the test starts to talk about the raid that on Donatu 5 and, and, that until killed the her test parents. basically shows her dead parents. Like, yeah, until shows the, test the death of her parents. Triggers her PTSD. Yeah, they show her is... clips of their like, clips of the colony exploding the science outpost, yeah. which is where... And Sarek supposedly was the one who invited her parents to come. 
and wanted mm-hmm. them like wanted them there, which is why I think, which is what I've read um, about the reasoning that he specifically took her in was that he felt responsible. Um, and then he comes over and talks to her after she has she has a breakdown and she starts answering a, she starts missing a bunch of questions mm-hmm. and begs the machine to stop and Sarek comes over and says. Well, um, kind of semi tries like doesn't really reassure her just sort of identifies the fact that it's her heart that's getting in the way of her yeah performance of, of her performance and she's sort of this as a little girl you can kind of see she's sort of lost at what to do about that right that that she wants to be more Vulcan mm-hmm. I think yeah and she just wants to please yeah yeah actually I, yeah I wonder if I wonder if that's maybe we'll see that that addressed later on that she wanted to be Vulcan. So she didn't have to feel the pain of her, of losing her parents, yeah. but found it realizes is realizing as an adult, she can't cut out the emotional side of herself. Like Vulcans can, she doesn't well, have she, that kind of, she actively says later in the episode that uh, when she's in conversation with Sarah over the hologram, that her emotion informs her logic. Right. Which might mean that, she, and I'm wondering if that's, if she's going to, blame that sentence if that's what she's going to look back at and realize that that's when she kind of went astray that she detached herself from following Sarek fully and decided to kind of go off on her own and this is what happens i think it's going to be the other way around what do you mean i think that it's going to be that she tried to make the logical decision of this attack will say making the wrong decision is what will save the crew as opposed to making making decision the decision that flies in the face of what i know is morally right is what will save the crew logically uh i think that feels like i don't know it it feels a little bit like overthinking just given how how um, it feels like this the, there wasn't a lot of subtext in this pilot and it feels like that idea is dependent on a lot of subtext i just mm-hmm. i feel it it feels more likely to me that she would desperately she would be motivated by her fear of the klingons which is a scene that we you know we get that immediately hammered home in this flashback that she's got a fear and she has some serious emotions about these people and i think in an effort to suppress her emotions she doesn't realize how much how they are informing her decision badly Mm-hmm. So when she says, hey, my emotions inform my decision, she's banking on the fact that she really wants to do this, meaning it's the right choice, uh, is the fact that it's the right choice when it might not be, when it co- when it probably is coming from a place of revenge and anger and fear. And she really shouldn't be basing her decision off of off of this emotion. But, you know, she's not Sarah. She doesn't have Sarah on her shoulder telling her to suppress, suppress, suppress all the time. So that's does that make sense mm-hmm. that it's more of that? But. How do you, I mean, are you, are you particularly excited by this sort of internal war that she has with herself or does it feel like really treaded ground already? Just the uh, sort of, vault, the, the, the eternal conflict between Vulcan logic and human um, impulsive impulsion and or human impulse and emotion. I feel like we're going to see that for the most part, she's conquered it or, and that this is the one time that it failed her. Oh, okay. That, maybe that not. she found that happy middle ground. And maybe this is going to signal, maybe we'll be dealing with the fallout of her loss of confidence. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> once she wakes up from the flashback, we see that she's got the radiation burns on her face and she runs to the bridge and the <laughs> doctor, um, I forget his name. But yeah. he was on Thirty Rock as Jack's page, and he's wonderful. Uh, she is that who that was? Yeah, it was. I f- That's Malik, awesome. Malik Panchali. That. Malik, Malik Panchali. Yeah, he's Jack's assistant and um, um, bright eyed, bushy tailed page on Thirty Rock. It's his his nemesis. Or no, 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 he's Liz's nemesis. Anyway, sorry, that's not relevant. He runs after her. He's like, you don't want to die of genetic unspooling, but she has to tell everyone about the Klingons. So she runs on the bridge and. I would love to discuss this with you because I wonder how you felt about it. People don't believe her and they openly don't believe her about the Klingons. Yeah, they, they say that it's that it's that she has a concussion and yeah, I that surprised me as well. That it... and, and I, maybe she's the XO. I was thinking about content. Yeah, she's the XO. 
and maybe I was already thinking about contact, but the, oh, the recording was corrupted. Yeah, but you still have the eyewitness report of someone you trust. Exactly. And it also it reminded me, this scene just kind of, the scene um, really brought home a feeling that I had in, in our first scene with Saru and Burnham, where they're kind of like pettily fighting over who runs the science station mm-hmm. on the bridge in front of the captain. They're like shoving each other. They're half shoving each other out of the way of this panel. And I was like, okay, I get it. These two don't like each other, but that is fucking stupid. That's, that was just so silly to me. Like Starfleet is still elite military. You don't like push and poke and, p- and pick at people on the bridge and have this petty crap happen. And then fast forward to this guy openly questioning a woman who outranks him, an officer right. who outranks him and telling Especially her that she's when later in this, in the episode, we see that that's not something that Georgiou supports. Exactly. She even says like, don't you talk to-? when they drag her into the writing room? Yeah. Giorgio says, don't you like, what are you thinking? And part of me was like, what the hell are you thinking? I have to, like, take care of your minions. I it, it that just yeah that was a little bit that was a development that I just was like that this is don't forget that Starfleet is military. I mm-hmm. mean it seems like you haven't at the end of this very dramatic pitch black wizen gamut like train. <laughs> My goodness. Yeah, I mean I'm glad that you felt that way too, and I wasn't crazy. Yeah, maybe she was on trial by the Q. See that that if Chanda Lancy shows up on this show. <laughs> I, 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 I could just die because I don't think I could. It'll be a sign one way or the other. <laughs> My life's not going to get any better. <laughs> uh, that's hyperbolic. So Georgiou in this in this scene starts to believe her just because she's convincing enough. And they decide to lock weapons on the beacon, I believe, that's obstructing their sensors. So at this point, yeah. the Klingon ship hasn't decloaked. They don't know that anything is there. Right. And it's so she they decide like, OK, we'll draw you out. You decided you got us here. So let's lock weapons. We won't fire. But hopefully this will provoke like this will make they want the clans to show themselves. Mm-hmm. This will make something happen. Exactly. Um, Saru is in the background saying, no, we should obviously leave. We are there. If there because are Klingons, this will make something happen. Yeah, this will make something happen. So... They lock weapons and the Klingons appear and their ship is massive and Saru's little sensors on like the back of his neck <laughs> like fan out. Yeah, he, he like he, the dinosaur, the spitting dinosaurs from Jurassic Park. I always thought I'd like that? the baby squid in um, Finding Nemo. <laughs> <laughs> she inks like, oh guy, it's made me ink. That's what that felt like. <laughs> it's like Saru inking. <laughs> it was kind of cute. I like Saru. He annoys me already, but I like him. Yeah. Um, he annoys in the right way right now. Yeah. And it's the Klingons appear. And I don't... Georgiou attempts to heal them. Yep. But I don't... Do they even respond at this point? Or do they just they respond? Do not, they don't respond okay. until the Admiral shows up. That's right. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Um, uh, they respond just, by... Uh, is that when lighting. they turn the lights on? They, well, they have a conversation about it where they refer to it as the light of Kalos, and that's the first right. time they've ever named it. And then it gets, um, then I believe that's when Vok is chosen that, as Vox. Torchbearer, because yep. this guy was supposed to light, okay, the, the guy that, um, the red shirt Klingon that Mike <laughs> killed was supposed to light the beacon. It's very Asgardian. Okay, so Idris Elba died, so they're, so Thor needs to pick, like, somebody else from his entourage to light the torch but to light the beacon of Kalos and draw yeah. the other houses so he picks Vok who is and um the guy's brother uh stands up first and he wants to do it but he doesn't blindly follow Takuva so Takuva's like fuck off and um then Vo- then this guy Vok who is an albino Klingon which we've seen before yes it, we I, have yeah we've seen albino Klingons before just so one we'll chat about that in a second and he was a hundred years yeah, old yeah well um one second so Folk stands up and he talks about he doesn't come from a house, but he like Klingons about honor for like 20 minutes and then holds his hand over fire and yep. for 20 he, more minutes. He, yeah, until he, he is like, over the fire. Yeah. And so Takuvma is like, what? yeah, see, I told you Klingons have zero gel. And so yeah. until Takuvma is finally like, dude, it's all right. Like, stop it. You're going to stop yeah. you're freaking me out. Uh, and then the comment I saw on Reddit was, I don't think you understand that torchbearer is metaphorical. <laughs> 
Um, and then it's also revealed via flashback that this whole thing was staged, that Vok and Takuvma are old friends. Um, Takuvma... <laughs> yeah, well, we find that. We find that out later. Um, and then at this almost... Um, as if on cue, Takuvma is telling... As if on cue, Takuvma tells his fellow Klingons that... Oh, wait tells his fellow Klingons that Starfleet will bring reinforcements and they're here to attack. The Starfleet ships that Giorgio has called for backup because of the Klingons show up on their long range sensors. So everybody's like, holy mm-hmm. shit, no. that's right. This guy's amazing. It was very much Dothraki Daenerys walking out of the fire. <laughs> it just worked out real well. Um, yeah. And then the Shenzhou stays because they're the only line of defense at this point because their backup hasn't gotten there between the Klingons who've now decloaked and a small Andorian, con- and Andorian colony that's nearby. So they stick around and that's when the beacon goes off. Mm-hmm. And it's very sunny on the bridge for... Yeah. Uh, again, stealing from Reddit, but it turns out that the Klingons have weaponized lens flare. Yeah. They kind of did. Like, And this was another, uh, this was another part of the show that I was like, okay, this is like... Either have the lens flare or have the camera movement. Please don't. Mm-hmm. Like, you can't have both. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it was a, it was a cool effect. It brought up why maybe they don't have windows in the bridge, uh, on the bridge moving forward. Um, yeah, so that was the deal. It seems like they were, it was just kind of an odd choice. It was just an odd disruption. And it was odd to have a ship, like, you're right felled essentially by not having sunglasses at hand it yeah a, like that was just i didn't hate it it was just str- it was a strange thing to have a sense of urgency about yeah um but that's a sense of urgency michael really has she runs down immediately she leaves and runs to talk to Sarek. Mm-hmm. um even though george was like you want to leave the bridge now one of my Constant thoughts in watching uh, the Orville has been, wow, people run off the bridge a lot. And it kind of fits now. Okay, this is a Starfleet thing. People do this. (laughs) You can't start using the Orville to justify Star Trek canon. (laughs) That's not going to fly with me. It's not going to fly on the show. (laughs) So she runs, um, Michael runs back, contacts Sarek, Sarek, um, his hologram shows up. Nitpicky Trek fans whine that they didn't have this technology at this point. <laughs> I give them the finger and say that if we can make Tupac on stage at Coachella in 2015, we can certainly do this. That wasn't when that happened. That happened before. But then, yeah, I feel like if humans have already done it on Earth, it's Star Trek canon. Yep. I think that's reasonable. So she talks to Sarek and she remembers him encountering the Klingons and he's like, whoa, why do you want to know what's going on? And she says, no, no, that's, that's fine. I'm, I've totally got this under control. I am absolutely not going to do something totally crazy to Klingons because of my very, very yeah. traumatic past with them. And Sarek's like, okay, I totally believe you. And tells her how the Vulcans dealt with Klingons, which is by always firing first. Yeah. And she relays this information to Georgia because it, the, the, the logic behind that is that since the Klingons will attack anything they deem vulnerable if you fire back at them they might think twice because they're not stupid right. and george's and, response is are you fucking high yeah and sarek even says he was like whoa hold the phone like just because this works with vulcans it does not mean it will work with humans and that is exactly the reason it does not work because they're humans and they've specifically been drawn here for a purpose and mm-hmm. by opening fire or locking weapons as they eventually do they've just played into to takuvma's hands right um kind of beautifully if you think about it but we'll get to that um Later, so she runs. So this is when Michael runs up to the bridge, attempts like yeah, tells Georgiou, who like you said is like the fuck, and then yeah. Michael like takes her to takes her in the ready room for a little talk, and then comes out alone. Yep, closes the blinds, <laughs> and it's like it's totally fine. <laughs> this was just this was to me where I was just like oh sh- oh um. Yeah, so they I should look it up to it, but yeah, they she drags Georgiou, or Georgiou takes Michael into the ready room, draws the blind, and is like, what is going on with you? How mm-hmm. can you openly defy me? You can't openly contradict me on the bridge. That kind of thing will destabilize a crew. And Michael is just desperate, desperate, desperate to convince her that they need to do this, that this is the only way they'll survive, that they're totally screwed. They have to use this strategy. And Georgiou tells her to stand down, 
And there's this brilliant moment. Like, this is the only reason I, wa- I wanted to go over this. That brilliant moment where Sonequa Martin Green kind of steps back and she sort of breathes and says she's sorry and looks sort of crazily at Georgiou and says, I may not be myself. Mm-hmm. And a tear falls down her place. And it felt just because I finished watching Walking Dead like this week and finished on her last episode of Walking Dead. Um, it was so creepy and so effective. And when she nerve pinches her right there, it was like, oh, no. <gasps> yeah. What just happened? Um, just on so many levels, because an EXO nerve pinching their captain after working with them for seven years in a highly combustible situation where it is far from the far from the best course of action. And she has virtually no reason to think that this is going to work was just Mm -hmm. astonishing to see on Star Trek. Uh, Spock did it. Yeah, but under this, like, when and what was the episode about? Uh, it, he did it once, obviously, in Wrath of Khan. Well, that... Mm. That, was, that was different. That was So I Can Die Instead of You. Um, and then there was another one where I think it was... Uh, Kirk may have been mind-controlled or something. Yeah. Neither one of those was a pilot for a new series, though. Yeah. So I think placing it here makes it... I, yeah, I mean, Spock and Kirk are... I, 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 pretty, I'm just like, saying this is... that it is not... It, it, that so many people are... Mike haters because of it. And my response is Spock did it. Oh, that. Oh, what, well, those people don't have the insight. God gave a rock. I think it was. I think that they wanted to. I liked that how explosive it was in the sense that we are not going to. We are not going to adhere to the fact that everyone who joins Starfleet by and large is like shares the same set of moral values and doesn't mm-hmm. make giant mistakes. She fails so hard in this episode. And that is not. We, we're not used to that. Everyone's been a phenom. Kirk is a phenom. Picard is a phenom. Cisco was a phenom. Janeway, mm-hmm. I could go on, obviously. Um, they're all people at the top of their game. And much is made of that in Star Trek. How hard it is to get into Starfleet Academy. How hard, like, how Starfleet Academy is the elite. How Starfleet is elite. And so to see someone who is cl- who clearly belongs there when it comes to intelligence and ability make this decision was mm-hmm. kind of scandalous to make such an important decision and have it be something she recognizes later as a mistake a huge mistake um or if yeah. not a mistake at least wrong mm-hmm. you and you, we really do see that by by the end just, yeah that, that she does hold by starfleet's values and recognizes that this was against them mm-hmm. yep and that's really that's even more tragic just given how much she loves Philippa. Mm-hmm. And so this is the scene, by the way, that I started shipping them. And <laughs> my my shitty OTP record for Star Trek continues. <laughs> Ridiculous. I don't even know why I bother anymore. So uh, we have kind you, of a... You are cool... not allowed to ship anyone with Saru. <laughs> it, it doesn't down. mean that he's going to die. It just means that he's not going to get with whoever I ship him with. So we end with the Klingons. I Do we end with Michelle Yeoh? We end with Michelle Yeoh in? coming back out. Oh, yeah. And, and holding the thing. And then the Klingons jumping into frame. She holds, right. Yeah, she comes out. So Mike runs onto the bridge and is like, hi, guys. So, yeah, the captain like just told me that she wants me to fire and everybody. That, like, I know yeah, she, 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 she's busy um, filing the we're going to fire weapons paperwork. Yeah, so like let's she just, just go ahead and get ready. Yeah, yeah. She thought it would be, you know, a little bit contradictory or hypocritical if she came out and like, you know, completely reversed a decision that she had mm-hmm. shown no signs of reversing five minutes ago. So now she she's just do it. Yeah, I'm just going to do it and just don't go in her office ever. Yeah. Without yeah, there, there, there's nothing first. there. I'm going to go into the office first if you need anything. Cool. And then Saru's like, get the fuck she's out of here. <laughs> like, what? What? <gasps> No way. No way. And it's Saru just immediately doesn't believe her. And then <laughs> she locks weapons. And it was pretty much all for naught. Because then Michelle Yeoh walks out holding a phaser. And she is pissed. Yeah. Understandably so. And then, yeah, at and that then the Klingons point, show up. And then roll credits. Yeah, exactly. It turns out not to be relevant for long. Because they're completely outnumbered. And we're going to die anyway. So. Yeah. 
24 Klingon ships show up because the beacon of Kalos has been lit and the stage is set for episode two. Yes, where they, yes, 